Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast is a Christ-centered podcast established in 2019 and hosted weekly by Pastor Chris Busher. Addressing a host of topics such as the Great Commission, Christian discipleship, and often featuring interviews with special guests who are experts in their field. The views and events expressed on this podcast and all related materials belong solely to their author and not necessarily to the author's employer, organization, committee, or other group or individual. While all attempts are made to present accurate information, some information may become outdated over time. Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast makes every attempt to timely update any and all such information. Without further delay, here's another powerful episode of Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Faith and Family Fellowship. I'm your co-host, Dallas Montague, and it's great to be back here in the studio today. Like Chris mentioned in this in the last podcast, I will be recording a lot of the podcasts going forward. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity to be a part of this ministry, able to record more podcasts, hear other people's testimonies, hear people's stories. Um, It's been exciting so far, and we have a lot of podcasts um, coming up in the future. We have a lot of podcasts on hold, ready to record this next week, this next couple weeks. And so I'm really excited uh, to hear what these people have to say, for you guys to hear everything that's going to be put out. And here's a quick word from our sponsors, and then we'll get started. You're listening to the Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast. We'll be right back after this quick word from our sponsors. Ready to jumpstart your career? Want an adventure of a lifetime? Uncle Sam's International is looking for language teachers who are highly motivated and have what it takes to grow and expand their thriving ESL school in Brazil. We need teachers for English, Spanish, Italian, and more. Visit Uncle Sam's International on Facebook today. If you've ever had questions about food, the environment, or just living better in general, I'd like to point you to Let Them Eat Grass podcast. News travels fast nowadays, and Let Them Eat Grass podcast travels even faster. Join regenerative millennial farmer Austin Williams on his quest to peel back the veil on good food the world over. A former middle school teacher turned farmer, he became determined to combat the misinformation about food with a podcast as raw as the food he harvests. Join the growing movement today. Subscribe to his channel for story-based episodes that are meant to immerse you in the world of food and the soil it comes from without leaving you scratching your head. Learn the difference between organic, grass-fed, all-natural, and so many more. Each episode is about 20 minutes, so they can easily fit into a drive to work. Try one out, and you won't be sorry. Ask questions like it's 2019, podcast style. And so here in the studio today, I have a special guest, Dr. Oliver Phillips. Oliver, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing fine, Dallas. Very good. Very good. Enjoying the sunshine in Florida. That's great. Uh, That's good. Orlando, Florida. (laughs) I'm going to open us up in prayer really fast, and then we're going to begin, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this podcast. I just pray for all of our listeners today that they can hear your voice, that you can speak to them, that what Oliver has to say today will impact our hearts God, that we'll be encouraged, that we'll leave differently than we came into this podcast. And I just pray for any anybody who needs hope, anybody who needs change, that they will seek out Jesus, that they will know that Jesus is the answer, Jesus is the king, and that he has plans for our lives. And so thank you for this podcast once again. Thank you for um, just the opportunity to be a part of this ministry and to continue to, to go forward with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, for the next five to ten minutes, can you go ahead and share your Christian testimony with me? I'll tell you what, um, Dallas, uh, it goes back uh, since I got saved in 1962 in a little island called Trinidad and Tobago. And um, there was a tent meeting and the evangelist came in. And um, as a teenager, I went one night and and got saved and the rest has been history. It has been, I grew up as a Roman Catholic and eventually joined the Church of the Nazarene. And by the January of um, 1963, I was in Bible college and um, studied there for the ministry. Graduated in 1965 and um, started pastoring and uh, pastored for about three years uh, in Trinidad. And then I left and came to the United States in 1968. 
And uh, that was a revealing chapter. And boy, you know, it's a different culture. And um, I started as a youth ministry um, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, in New York. And then, sadly enough, um, after a, a couple of years, I strayed away from the church, lost my ministry and lost everything I had. And for a few years there, I was involved with, um, you know, th that kind of life that, that leads to destruction yeah. until uh, I, I came back to the Lord in 1985 and um the good thing about it is that um, the Church of the Nazarene was very, very good to me and, and redemptively in that they accepted me back and I started pastoring a church in, in the year 2000 and in Baltimore, Maryland. And God has been very good. My particular ministry, Dallas, has been to the underserved and drug addicts and alcoholics. And I find I relish, <laughs> if you will, in that type of ministry. And um, so after that, I, I left Baltimore and went to Washington, D.C., pastored there. While there, I attended uh, Howard University School of Divinity and did my postgraduate work there. And then um, they asked me to go to headquarters of the Church of the Nazarene. And um, I got there and went to headquarters in Kansas City. And stayed there for 11 years and became the director for compassionate ministry and director for multicultural ministry in the United States and Canada, um, given st developing strategy, if you will, uh, for 21 different people groups. And that has really been the, the, the part of my life that I really relish. And after 11 years in headquarters, I decided it was time to get back and get my my feet dirty again, and I entered. I took a small church in in um, Orlando, Florida. Uh, and I have been pastoring here for ten years, a small uh, congregation. And uh, six weeks ago, I retired officially from pastoral ministry, and. Um, so uh, I've, I've, I've now been recycled, if you will, into another life. So I'm doing writing books and developing online courses. And but but Dallas, I tell you what, God has been very good to me. And my first book, as a matter of fact, I wrote was God of a Second Chance. For God indeed has given me a second chance uh, to come back and to do ministry and to uh, to be able to touch the lives of so many people. Yeah, it sounds like he's been faithful. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like some of our listeners already know, I relate to that lifestyle of addiction as well. And yeah. so I totally agree with ministering to people who are in that life as well with myself working yeah. at Teen Challenge for a little bit oh, of time. Yeah. And so, yeah, I totally agree. I share the same heart as you. That's good. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Today we're going to record a podcast about your books. And so yeah. I have a couple books here, about five books. How many books have you wrote in total? Uh, six. Six books in total. Okay. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about five of those books. Yeah. Um, and so the podcast today is just going to be about your books. The other podcast we will release will be about your courses, mm -hmm. just for our listeners to know, to be expecting a second podcast Good. from Oliver. So. Um, your first book, Nuts and Bolts Incorporated, a toolkit to equip congregations for para para parochial <laughs> para parochial ministry. Okay, yeah. please tell me about that. I have never heard of para ministry before. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's it's a slant on the ministry today is considered to be parochial, okay. and in my doctoral dissertation, it's my doctoral dissertation was a, a para parochial paradigm for ministry okay. and, um, and what I did in, in that dissertation was to uh, chart out a course of action for churches and congregations who would like to embark upon social ministry, uh, ministry to the poor, and uh, particularly in terms of trying to do it in such a way that um, you take advantage of the opportunities that the legal entrapments that you have 
in, in, in the country. So I, what I, I do is I, I, I help congregations uh, do all the legal work, the 501c in America, it's the 501c3 and the, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the charter and the bylaws and all of that. So it, what they do is they form a separate entity from the church, uh, from the local congregation with a board of directors. So it's, sep it's a separate entity and that way they are able to do um, ministry. And uh, of course, it, uh, one of the things I mentioned in the book, it, 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 it eliminates the, the liability that, that the local congregation uh, may have. Because one of the things is that, you know, social ministry is nasty, <laughs> excuse the word, it's nasty ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a litigious society, there are so many people that would uh, uh, would would seek the opportunity to sue you. Uh, um, and so, what the book do, what the book does is to describe a way in which you can uh, enter into that type of ministry and set, form a separate entity for doing ministry. Okay, and so you would say this book is written for the churches, like just specifically for the churches? Oh, no question. No question. It's for okay. congregations okay. that would like okay. to embark upon ministry to the underserved. Okay. Why did you choose this title for the book, Nuts and Bolts? <laughs> well, it's an expression um, that we, we use in terms of what, what, are the, what is the bottom line? What are the things that you use? Uh, so, so we call it the nuts and bolts, the, the, the real elementary things that you need to do and to know in order to do a ministry or business or whatever you So I call it the nuts and bolts. And of course, when Dallas is that when you form an entity, uh, you, what you have to do is to incorporate it with the state and with the, um, the, with the IRS. And so it is called an incorporated, uh, an incorporated entity. So the name of a, when when someone forms an agency, they call it whatever incorporated. So this is nuts and bolts incorporated. incorporated. So, yeah, so like it's a it. fictitious That's... it's a fictitious entity that um, mm -hmm. that is formed. Yeah, one of the things I read on the overview of the book was, "Would your community miss you if your church no longer existed?" I think that's powerful. If yeah. would your community miss you? Like, what impact are you making in your community? Yes, that's good. Yes. Yeah. In your studies and in your experience, um, what is a biblical responsibility of the church in its own community? I, I, you know, I think um, Dallas that I'm driven by Luke four seventeen through twenty one, um, where Jesus Christ when. He came, as a matter of fact, the first opportunity that Jesus Christ had to preach, uh, he talked about the fact that he has come as the Messiah to, to release those that are kept captive, held captive, to visit those that are in prison and to, you know, to feed those that are hungry, to give drink to those. So I, I believe that the church has an obligation to impact the community, to make a difference in the community. And that's why I have said that if your church moves, who would miss your church? And if the church, if the church doesn't make an impact in the community, then I, I think that biblically the church has missed its mission. I love that. I love when I just preached a message on Luke chapter four oh. on Sunday. Yes. And I love that. I love how that works. Yeah. Like, ah, everything just lines up. It's so perfect. Sure. It's sure. awesome. What blows my mind about what you were just saying about Luke 4 is Jesus stepped out and began his ministry. And then they were getting ready to throw him off of a mountain. <laughs> they, were getting, they were taking him up to the top. Like yeah. Jesus steps out and they're about to throw him off the mountain in, in the very beginning. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of opposition stepping out in the ministry that you're talking about right now. Yeah, because, um, you know, some folks, um, they, they bifurcate. Um, they, 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 they believe that there is the sacred and the secular, and so that the church is called to do only sacred ministry. But I, I don't believe in bifurcation. I believe that the church's responsibility is like, like a boat with two oars. And you, you can't use one oar, otherwise you go around in a circle, but you have two oars that are, are moving the boat forward. And I think the church is not, it's not, Dallas is not either or, it's both and. 
we must be doing both and and that's that's very important and i think that's what drives the type of social ministry that we that we uh, that i encourage people to to get involved with i like it sounds great yeah um in your second book the next book that i have i uh-huh. there's no way i can pronounce this correctly e Plurible, pluribus unum. How do you say that one? <laughs> that one, Dallas, is a. The e is in Latin. The, a, the it's pronounced a pluribus unum. And unum. On, okay. On every coin in the United States, you would see the words a pluribus unum, which really means out of many one. Okay. And so that's what that's why I named the book, and it's a it's a compendium. It's a uh, it's a thirteen individuals that I approached, and I said, you know, uh, and they are all experts in multicultural ministry, and I asked them to write a chapter. I have three chapters in there, and so ten chapters are written by individuals, you know, seminary presidents and. Uh, Russell Begay, who became the president of the Navajo Indian tribe. But it is a book in which, and I call it the challenges and opportunities in multicultural ministry, because there Mm -hmm. are challenges. And there are challenges within and without. Within your congregation, you have challenges because individuals really feel that the task of the church is only to preach the gospel, and to get people saved. And I am saying that you have to deal with those challenges. In other words, to educate individuals uh, in, in that the, the responsibility of the church, there is, there, is, there is church work and there is the work of the church. Uh, mm. Most people like church work. Church work is working with a missionary society and doing young people's work within the church. But the task of the church is to make an impact on the community. So the challenges are in inside the church and outside. And of course, there are great opportunities uh, on the outside. And individuals are really looking for the church to be relevant. And, you know, uh, I, I grew up in Youth for Christ and uh, Dallas, and uh, there was a time in Youth for Christ where everybody was really uh, excited about Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. Today, the, the generation that we have today is not saying Christ is the answer. What they are saying, what are the questions? What are the questions that people are asking today? And it is the responsibility and the task of the church to answer those questions, not to just give generic answers to questions, but to be able to be relevant in, um, yeah. in relating to the, the the world. And so what, um, just thinking of you saying that, what might be some of the biggest questions that are asked today? Well, the questions that I, I think, the, one of the questions that I ask particularly is, is like, should Christians be involved in politics? And, okay. and and this generation of young people, they are they they want to be relevant. They want to uh, make an impact in the world. And and to some of them, their grandparents or their parents says, well, you know, you become a Christian, you can't be involved in politics, and you you can't do this. And then of course there are the the the, the sexual challenges that you have, where young people are asking. Uh, uh, for answers from the church with respect to uh, homosexuality, with respect to same-sex marriage, with respect to divorce, um, and, and all of that, and uh, you know, people living together outside of the marital constraints, and young people are asking those questions, and and they expect the church to to be able to answer them. Yeah, those were some of the questions I was going to ask. Yeah. So I'm glad that you you touched on that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um. What is the hope for this book to accomplish in the hands of its readers? Uh, that it, it, it is my hope that it will incite individuals to be involved in multicultural ministry. Um, you know, there, there was a time, Dallas, when we used to say, you know, America is a melting pot. And um, that, you know, all peoples who come to America, they will just become one million, you know, just one melting pot. I think that has changed. It, it is, I, I, I think what, when you talk about ethnicity and the work that we do among different ethnic groups, it's more like a salad bowl. Um, you have the cucumber and you have the, the, the lettuce and you have the radishes and, and they, they, they maintain their own identity 
but what they what they have in common is the dressing. <laughs> and, and I say that we don't ask people to give up their ethnic heritage, but what we do, we have to find a way that cultures within the church, ethnicities within the church can work together. And those are the challenges. And I trust that this book might might answer those questions. And I also see that it does this book talk about immigrant population as well? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it is said that uh, by the year, Dallas, that by the year 2050, that uh, we'll be a minority majority nation. The, the ethnic groups that are coming into our country, I believe, Dallas, that this is the work of God that God is bringing. Uh, we have spent, most denominations have spent billions of dollars going overseas to take the gospel to foreign lands. Well, guess what? God has a good sense of humor. Um, the mm. folks that we have sent missionaries to evangelize, well, they, they, they are now here. God has brought mm. them here. And God has said, now you evangelize them when they come here. And so that's my, my challenge to folks is let's understand that the, the, the people groups within the United States and Canada, we have a rich, a rich mission field right here without having to, to, to do airfare and without having to go overseas. I know you are involved in that in, in, in Brazil. Uh, by no means am I condemning you for what you're doing. But I think we, we have to take advantage of what God is doing by bringing all these ethnic groups. Uh, when I worked in headquarters, is I was I was developing strategy for 21 different ethnic groups, and uh, it is it was so great to see all these folks that have come to America, and now we are evangelizing them right right here. Yeah, I, I being a missionary myself, I understand the importance of being called to stay as well. Yes, 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 sure, sure. And the other part of it is that those same individuals who have left Haiti and left Brazil and left Portugal and have come here and they have found Christ and they are fired up about ministry, they are the uniquely they are uniquely equipped to go back to their countries as missionaries. They know the culture yeah. and they I mean God God has a good sense of humor. <laughs> the next book is culture trumps religion oh, every oh. time the ethical cultural <laughs> challenge for the church yeah um because uh, and, and and this goes back to, and all these books are tied into what what is you know the the, the genre of cultural intelligence uh culture trumps religion i came down to a church uh, when i left and i came down to a church in um in uh, orlando I came down and I had 36 um, all white members of the church. And of course I'm black. And it, in the 60, 65 year history of that congregation, they have never had a non-white member. And of course they have never had a non-white pastor. So I came in and uh, within uh, four months, 18 of those 36 people had left. I and and I wow. I said well well why have they they gone and and you know because black folks started coming into the church and of course so that created some tension and individuals now I decided to write a book then and I was going to call the book white flight and I thought that was a little too arrogant of me to write write it that way and it will cause too much too much trouble so I, I what I found out is that. It is an educative process. I, I, all the folks that have left and gone to other Anglo congregations, I don't believe it is a heart problem. I believe it's a head problem. And my mm. job, if I had the opportunity and they, if they would have allowed me, I would have educated them as to how do you have church with different cultures. And they were uncomfortable, and they, you know, we we have we have something in church called passing of the peace, that we go around and hug everybody on Sunday mornings, and of course, so you know, here's an, another culture coming in, and it was a little uncomfortable for some folks, and um, you know, you know, other cultures going into your kitchen and and doing all that, so it was a little uncomfortable. So what I said, culture trumps religion every time. 
And we have to understand, Dallas, that culture is, don't ignore, ignore culture. Culture is very important, and the, the, one of the reasons why churches have such a difficult time in a multicultural context is that they ignore culture, and that they don't pay culture the respect that it, it, it is that it is due. So culture trumps religion. Now, it is not prescriptive; it's descriptive. So uh, you know, one of my one of my general superintendents who read the book. And he reached in the middle of the book and he called me and he says, Oliver, uh, I'm reading this book, Culture Trumps Religion, uh, every time. And I'm halfway through and I'm not hearing you say that religion trumps, trumps culture. And I said to him, the book is not prescriptive. I'm not saying this, that culture is supposed to trump religion. I'm saying uh, this is what I see. This is what I'm seeing out there. And all I'm highlighting, Dallas, is the importance of culture. And we have to, if we're going to have a multicultural church, we must understand quite well that individuals like to remain in their own culture and they come in and we have to appreciate the culture. And it is only as we appreciate the culture that we will be able to work together. I think that's a good vision for a church. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in the book, all I'm saying is that we ought to we ought to pay attention to culture. Don't ignore the culture. And people can't we cannot expect, Dallas, that people leave their culture at the door before they come in. Understand that they have their culture and it is very important. And I have also here that the types of culture is there's organizational culture, institutional culture, generational yeah. culture, corporate yeah. culture, gender culture, national mm-hmm. culture, mm-hmm. and much more. Yeah. And yeah. so that's that's good to inform us on the different types of culture. Yeah, sure. The next book, The Power of One: Sermons That Transform a Minority a Minority into the Majority. <laughs> I uh, that 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 book uh, Dallas is 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 really a book that um, encourages people to look into the potential that there is, the latent possibilities that there is in in one person doing. Uh, going out and doing ministry. So I talk about, in that book, I talk, for instance, about the power of one word, uh, which is my favorite chapter, the power of one word, where if, I use if, how important if is in in the Bible. Like if my people are called by my name. Uh, And so that's what I highlight. If, if, you know, if you turn to Christ. And and so I talk about how the, the power in that one word, I talk about the power of a, of a missing person, for instance, uh, uh, you know, in, in Thomas, that when Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus Christ came and, and there was a missing person. Thomas was the missing person. And I talk about the powerful message that there is. Why was Thomas absent? Why was Thomas not there? And what lessons we can learn from that missing person? Uh, and I, I, I say that, you know, and, and what I highlight there. Dallas is that 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 why that what 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 Thomas said was I will not believe unless I have first hand knowledge. In other words, second hand religion was not good enough for Thomas, and so we should approach life the same way. That second the, the religion of my mother and father is not good enough, but first hand religion is what um, is what we need. And I talk about the the the, the missing. Uh, immigrant, the, uh, the power of the immigrant woman Esther, and 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 you know these individuals. So I, I I think it's 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 one of the books that individuals will realize that they can they can do much more. They don't have to wait until they are aligned with somebody else, but they within them it's like the guy who was walking along the the shore where the 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 the, the rivers had the, the ocean rather had come on the shore that night and you know uh, seashells were all over and there he was w- walking along and he was t- kind of taking urchins sea eggs and one by one he he was throwing them back in the water um, so that uh, they can uh, live and and one guy was walking by and he saw him and he says you don't believe that that you can <laughs> you can save all of those and he picked up one and he says, I, at least I can save this one and threw it back. So I think the, the, it is the importance of one person uh, being able to do it. You don't have to wait until you are a crowd. You, God has placed within you 
uh, the latent possibilities of being all that uh, a very powerful person. So that's why I talk about the power of one person in the church going out and reaching. If if each person win one, we'll have a great church. Do you have any in any powerful testimonies from readers who have read that book and just like, yes, I am the one, I, the power of one. You know, I've harnessed who I am. You know, do you have any testimonies from that? Yeah, I, I, I was in I was in California, um, as a matter of fact, preacher doing a revival. And um, this one of one one young person, as a matter of fact, uh, came up and, and talked about they had read the book. They had bought the book and talked about the fact that they it revolutionized their own ministry, Dallas. And, and, and they begin to talk. And this guy was in high school and begin to talk about the individuals in high school who he had been able to one by one just reached and started a nice little student student movement there in in the high school because of being awakened to the fact that you don't have to wait until you are a crowd and he single-handedly went out there and began to talk to his high school buddies one by one a tremendous ministry that he has uh the last book is the elephant in the room and we're yeah. going to talk about this in this interview and actually in the second interview yeah yeah because i think you took it on to be one of the courses yeah and so Go you ahead. know, you know the, the elephant in the room, Dallas, is 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 that that is is an old expression. There is that something that most people understand that it's so, but they don't want to talk about it. It's like the family reunion. Every year you have the family, <laughs> you have a family reunion, and there's Uncle Jacob. That everybody knows that within half an hour, Uncle Jacob is going to be drunk. <laughs> and he becomes boisterous. Everybody knows that. He is the elephant in the room. And whenever you have family reunion, nobody wants to talk about it. But everybody knows that, hey, Uncle Jacob. And so the, the culture is the elephant in the room. That we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to admit that we are different. And I'm saying we must admit that we are different. And culture is the elephant. And I said you have to name the elephant in order to tame the elephant and so that's mm -hmm. that's the, the whole idea is that let's talk about culture and what is culture and so I, I, the book really defines culture and culture is like an iceberg for instance um, culture is like an iceberg what we remember the Titanic and what most people see is the 20% of the iceberg at the top and we and that's what we look at a culture and we see that and we think that's culture but you have to go 80 percent of the iceberg is submerged below the surface and we have to understand that and if we understand why people do what they do and why certain cultures have a certain propensity uh to 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 an idea th then of course we will be able to to work with them so we have to spend time that's the elephant in the room and we ought to talk about it yeah Okay, Oliver, and if you could just take the next couple minutes and just direct the, the listeners to your traffic, how can the, the listeners find you? Well, they can find me in two ways. Um, they, they, all of the books are on Amazon. And if they would remember the titles, <laughs> they can go to Amazon and, and search for me there, or they can type my name, uh, Oliver R. Phillips. And they can get me on Amazon. And uh, the other way that they can get me is on my website, um, www.culturephillips.com. That's C-U-L-T-U-R-E-Phillips.com. And they can surely get me there. And do you have a YouTube page as well? No, no, no. I, well, of course, I, I, I upload everything on YouTube, so mm -hmm. they can always find if they if they go and they type my name in and put next to it cultural intelligence, uh, they can see all my videos that I've done. I've done quite a lot of videos, and they can find them there. Okay, sounds good. And Oliver, will you just pray us out to end this podcast? Surely, Father, we thank you for the call of God on our lives. And we thank you for this awesome responsibility that you have given us to make a difference in our world. And you have brought all types of people into our lives and into our little world. And we, we feel it is an awesome task that you have given us to evangelize and to reach all people 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this whole idea of touching those individuals whom you have placed in our lives, Lord, give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the grace to be able to to, 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 to deal with the elephant in the room, this whole idea of culture. And, uh, you know, like we have five fingers and they are all different. We all have different fingerprints and, and yet we, we all come together to accomplish a task. Make our church a multicultural church. Make our world a truly multicultural world so that we might be able to get along with each other and to reach each other. The bottom line, Lord, is help. We know what the bottom line is, is to reach other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we trust, Lord, that these books will be able to, will be a, a tremendous instrument in educating individuals and opening people's minds. And Lord, more than anything else, we would ask that you would make people commit to make a difference. In You've our world just listened to the Faith and Family Fellowship and Podcast. With your host, Pastor Chris Busher, Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast was recorded live in studio with final editing made before uploading. Subscribe today to Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast on iTunes or Google Play. For more fantastic daily content, visit Pastor Chris Busher online via Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't miss the next episode on Faith and Family Fellowship Podcast.